So the Google Pixel 6 Pro, it's finally here, the embargo's lifted, and I can finally talk about my experience with the most anticipated phone of the year. Google's been teasing this for months, people have been excited about it, and there's a lot to like. But in this video, we're gonna uncover how much is actually hype and how much is actually really exciting about this phone. Because there's a lot that's different. This is a very different phone from most other phones on the market. From the new Tensor chip to the camera bump or bar or the camera, the camera row, I don't know what you wanna call that, but you can see it's a very different design. And Google also added a lot of their own features, from the camera features on here like Magic Eraser, to other Googly features from the phone experience and things like that. And of course, this is also running Android 12 with Google's new Material U. We'll talk more about that in this video. But of course, there's so much to talk about. This is a very, very different phone. And I wanna focus on what's actually different. But obviously, everything's different versus the Pixel 5, I mean, what's different and exciting versus other phones on the market? And there's really four things we wanna focus on. In this video, I'll talk a lot about the Tensor chip, why Google chose to do that, and, and what it actually does with regards to performance and photos and, and, and battery life and things along those lines. And the second thing we wanna talk about are the features. Of course, as I mentioned, Google being a software company added a lot of great features on here. So we'll talk about which ones are exclusive to this device and which ones other Android devices get, as well as how well each of those features actually work. The third thing we'll talk about are actually the cameras, obviously, that being one of the biggest highlight on any Pixel phone. And we all know for a while, Google's been cranking out absolutely amazing photos from honestly really crappy hardware. So now that they have good hardware, well, I think you can see where that's going. And of course, the last thing is the physical design being so different, like I said, with that camera row and stuff. And so actually, let's start off with that. The design of this phone, I think, well, to put it simply, it feels like the Galaxy Note that we wanted to have this year. People that were Note users loved the boxy design, and, and now being forced to use the S21 just kind of felt wrong. And so now the Pixel 6 here, you can see, has that similar familiar boxy design, which is great for watching media and, and just all full body experience right there. You get a very boxy display that doesn't cut too much off the corners. It's also really bright, very vibrant. It has a nice waterfall edge around the, the left and right side, although I'll notice that it doesn't actually have too much of a palm rejection issue. So unlike a lot of wraparound displays, this one doesn't have any kind of accidental touches. It doesn't really utilize the edges too much with crazy edge lighting, things like that, but it does give you thinner looking bezels when you're looking at the front of this. So as far as media goes, I think that this phone does a great job. Great to watch media on here, 120 Hertz, vibrant, bright display. And like I said, it just feels like the Galaxy Note. In fact, it does so much that I a lot of times find myself looking for the S Pen on the bottom. And of course, flipping over to the back, we still have wireless charging, reverse wireless charging. We have three different colors with the Pro and three more colors with the regular and you know, all those basic stuff like that. The camera bump, well, we'll talk more about that in the camera test, but the physical design, overall pretty nice, with one exception. I personally am not a big fan of the buttons on this device, where, well, there's really two things. One of them, I am starting to get used to having the power button above the volume button. That's kind of weird and takes some getting used to, but really the thing that holds me back from really liking these buttons is how clicky they are. Some people like the sound of the clickiness, but to me, it feels a little bit too tactile and it feels like a cheaper button experience. It feels like the tolerances just aren't right. And, and I understand it's just the tack switch that they chose, but I wish it was a, something a little bit more subtle. Like it's a really delicate balance and I think they went a little too far on that. So let's talk about some of the features that I wasn't allowed to talk about when this was under embargo. There's some really exciting stuff, some big ones in the camera category, but looking at the rest of the phone experience, I mean, just literally the phone itself, like if you're on a phone call, there are a lot right there from the classic Pixel ones like Hold For Me, which I absolutely love when you're on a phone call or call screening or even auto call screening when you have a number that maybe you don't recognize, it'll automatically screen that. Those are awesome. But they're also adding a lot, of, a lot of other features in here that are related to texting. So we've seen like live translations and things like that, live transcriptions. That's always really been very popular with watching videos. But now Google's kind of pushing a lot of that into messaging where you can actually text somebody in your native language and they will receive it in their native language. So Google Translate being built into Messenger, I think that's something that I really like to see on here. Similarly, you do have uh, Google's interpreter mode. So if I just tap and hold the power button to summon assistant and I just say interpreter mode, it'll turn that on. It'll ask what, what, what two languages we want and then it can just switch back and forth. It's something that you already kind of could do with the Google Translate app, but having it built in natively just makes it feel faster. And on top of that, with the Tensor chip, as I'll talk about later, a lot of those are actually faster as well. 
Additionally, we're able to do things in Snapchat and, and anywhere else where, for example, you can just double tap open Snapchat and you can snap and message other people on Snapchat with other languages as well. So just like with Messenger app, you're able to do the same thing in Instagram or a WhatsApp or a lot of other apps out there. All of that, I think, gives you a more worldly experience. Like, it felt like Google was definitely focusing a little bit more on including not just the same demographics. So people with different languages, people with different skin tones, as we're gonna talk about with the cameras, like a lot more inclusion going on with this phone. And that was something they talked a lot about in their keynote. And tying in with this, another thing that Google's been doing is with Gboard, with being able to type on here, something that I've always noticed has been getting better and better, not just swipe texting, things like that, but also predictive typing. So if you are doing either voice to text, which is a huge one that they've been doing, um, or just typing itself, it will actually use your contacts and context of your texting. And the combination of all of that, it does a much better job than pretty much anything else out there. So uh, the example they used in their keynote, which I've been seeing as well, is if you're talking about somebody named like Catherine or something like that, it might default to spelling it with a K, but if you have a contact that starts with a C, it'll know that that's probably what it is. And rather than uh, suggesting similar words like cathedral or catharsis, or like all these other things, it'll go between Catherine with the K, Catherine with the C, like things that make more sense that actually go together. And so that kind of little experience stuff is definitely doing a lot better on this phone. So of course those are all great features, but they're definitely not nearly as exciting as the ones we're seeing in the camera app. Now the camera features on here, I think really bring it to the next level from the editing, which I'll show you in a second, but also just from the camera itself. So one of the big ones is the motion blurring. You can do a couple things with this where you can either have action pan or you can have long exposure and those are gonna do two different things. So one of them is when somebody's moving, you can kind of take a photo while you're moving with them. Everything in the background will get blurry, make it look like they're going really fast as you can see right here or long exposure if you're taking a photo of like a river, a waterfall or maybe a subway train, whatever it might be, you're gonna have that long exposure look right there that you otherwise really can't get with the phone. A lot of phones are just unable to do that. And so having that kind of software on here, I think you're gonna start to see that really copied with a lot of other phones because it's just a really cool thing to have. On the opposite, when you get into editing, this is just a bad portrait of me, you can go into edit and you have a lot of tools on here. Of course, the magic eraser is a big one and I'll get into a test with that in a second, but you also have kind of the opposite of motion blur, which is like unblur, face unblur. So if you're taking a photo at night and it's dark, and somebody's moving around a lot, they might be a little bit blurry. And you can use this tool to unblur their face. Now, it doesn't do the best job ever, obviously, because it can't, it's kind of just guessing based on the pixels you have, but it does a better job than just traditional sharpening tools would on like Adobe Photoshop, for example. But when you just take any photo and you go into tools on editing, you have a lot of cool things here. Of course, you could turn it into a portrait photo. You can adjust the lighting as you can see right there uh, and make it like a portrait light, which I, I think they do a pretty good job of, like you can actually choose exactly where the lighting's coming from, which I think is, is honestly kind of weird that it's able to do that, but, but it does a great job of that. That's, that's still really, really impressive. And a lot of the, the software on here that runs that style stuff is powered by the Tensor chip and their photo editing abilities on there. So one of the most exciting features on this phone was the magic eraser. And I've been testing this out for a while and I found that while there are plenty of situations that it works well, there are also plenty that it definitely doesn't work at all. And it comes down to the camera doesn't know what's behind the subject. So if you are you know, in the middle of a busy street and there's somebody in the photo behind you and you wanna get rid of them, well, Google doesn't know what the car behind them really looks like. So it's gonna guess and just kind of mush colors together. But other situations, if you're just, you know, there's a blue sky behind them or some green grass behind them, that's a lot easier to guess and figure out what's behind that. So in those situations, it does really well. So if you take an easy example, like right here, we have a blue pen sitting on my desk. And if I wanna get rid of that, I can just take the magic eraser, circle the pen, and it will just completely get rid of the pen. And now it, the desk looks like a pen was never even there. And I think that did a great job. But if we go back to another photo, so say like this photo right here, if I wanted to get rid of my iPhone, I could just go and circle the iPhone there and it knows I'm trying to get rid of that iPhone, but it doesn't know what's behind it. So you can see it kind of mushes the colors together and it does a decent enough job where it guesses what the intersections of those lines would really look like, but you can tell looking at the photo, like something's still up with that. Obviously it's not getting rid of reflections and shadows, but you know, still overall a very impressive piece of software. Now let's actually get into a camera test now and see how well they really perform. 
All right, so this is a video test with the front-facing camera. Honestly, I noticed that a lot of times there's a lot of noise in the background, especially when there's lower light. Here you can see that I think skin tones are a little, like a tad washed out. My red shirt looks a little bit on the yellowish orange side, but otherwise, it's doing a really good job. Sharpness looks pretty decent. The colors in the background look pretty accurate. So definitely not perfect, but probably a big step up from the Pixel 5. And now this is a video test with the rear facing camera. The wide angle lens I think does a fantastic job. You have a really nice natural blur when you move up close to things. And you can also zoom back. So if you zoom out, you'll see the ultra wide. Again, this one, very, very stable. But I noticed there is a lot of noise in the edges, like down here you might notice. We can also zoom in. So if we start here and just start zooming in, it's relatively seamless. You see a little bit of a jump between lenses. But otherwise, you can zoom all the way up to 20x and it is, in, again, incredibly stable. And this is the primary rear lens. I think this one is by far the best out of this entire camera. It does a pretty decent job, but leave a comment below and let me know how this looks and sounds to you. So taking a look at some of the photos, honestly, these all looked really amazing. The still photos on this camera did a fantastic job of capturing a lot of really lifelike color, great white balance, really nice natural sharpness as you can see here. And at the same time, they did a pretty good job of lifting the shadows and crushing the highlights to give you a nice dynamic range without being too flat. Now I think that pretty much in every situation I tried, including low light, everything just looked really natural and very realistic. And so overall, I'd say the camera did a great job. The ultra wide sometimes had a little bit of noise in the corners and it wasn't really that ultra wide. You can see between that and here, the wide angle, it's really only 0.7 versus 1x. Fortunately, the tele photo is 4x, which I think is great, and you can zoom in even further, really preserving detail every step of the way, all the way up to 20x zoom, which still is a completely usable photo. Very impressive. Now, of course, you can also do some other adjustments within the camera settings, so you can see like great sunrise photo right here, but you can actually change between the highlights and the darks on the camera, as well as the white balance very, very easily. The front facing camera did a pretty decent job, it looked realistic with photos, and looking at portrait mode with the front facing lens, it did a really good job honestly. Uh, it's a little more zoomed out than the rear lens as you can see right here, but again, both did a great job. So now for a quick speaker test. And what they're able to deliver at this price. guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Mike O'Brien and like I said- So last but not least, let's talk about the Tensor chip on here. Obviously a big exciting feature, Google's in-house silicon, they've been working on it for four years, and yet I think it's one of the most misinterpreted features of this phone. I think a lot of people are assuming that the Tensor chip is put in here for the same reason that the M1s are in the Max, to be faster, more efficient, more powerful, and while eventually Google's going to keep iterating and it will get faster, I don't think that's the main reason they did this. I think there's three main reasons they did this. The first one being so they can have their own features on here. Regardless of the speed, adding a dedicated portion of the processor to do things like the photo editing, the machine learning, all those little googly features that they wanted to add to make the video quality better, for example. That is something that I think was really important to them and they put in this chip specifically. So tailoring it to the needs and wants of Google is one thing, and also the ability to make things faster like machine learning for on-device transcriptions and translations ties in with the second thing being better security. By doing more things on device, it's going to be more secure. So now they have the Titan M2 chip, which is something they've talked about a lot. And so I think security on this is something that they're really pushing for to compete with the likes of Apple, which for a long time has really, I mean, some of its marketing, some of its actually doing it, really been promoting their security. So I think Google's really pushing that with this one. And I think the third reason that they brought the Tensor chip here, which is a huge one, is the ability to have longer lasting support. And I think Google in particular is really going to value the longevity of their devices because they're obviously a heavy software company. So they're able to sell this for $899, which is definitely a compelling price, but that's because they know people are going to use this phone for four years, five years, or even longer. And in that time, they're going to use a lot of Google apps, a lot of Google software, and in all of that use of software, Google's going to make a lot of money from ads or maybe even from subscriptions. If you're using Google Drive and you're paying for more storage, all of those things are going to earn Google money, not just from the purchase of the device, but also throughout the lifespan of this phone. So I think that's really why Google made the Tensor. Realistically, the battery life on here and the performance, I mean, the Google, the phone runs fast. I found that when you're editing photos, like if you take a photo and it, it you know, night sight, something like that, it definitely takes a beat to actually process that. So it's not lightning fast. I don't know how much of that is just really heavy software versus not the fastest chip. The battery life on here, I was definitely very impressed with it. Easily powers through an entire day, gets into the next day for me. 
Of course, it is a larger display and you are likely to watch more media, so it's not impossible to drain it in one day, but I find that this is nowhere near the crappy battery we saw in the Pixel 4, and I think Google finally came back with something that can definitely get you through a full day and maybe half of the next day. But that's my take on the Google Pixel 6 Pro. Overall, a fantastic device, and it really nails all the fundamentals and adds a lot of fun features on there. So really solid cameras, but also some really fun camera features. Great design with the Material U on, on Android 12, but also, again, some more fun features on there that can make your life easier when you're talking to people of other native languages or, or anything like that. And the overall design of this, like, I just really like how it's built. I love the camera bar. I think that's a great way to not have camera wobble when you're setting the phone down. Overall, a very impressive device. But is it going to be enough to actually convert iPhone users over to Android? Well, I actually made a full comparison between the iPhone 13 Pro and the Pixel 6 Pro. I'll link that down below. You guys can check that out after this video, but leave a comment and let me know what you think of the Google Pixel 6 Pro. Is this a phone you'd buy or is there something that you wish it had that it doesn't? As always, if you enjoyed this video, consider liking and subscribing. I'm Mike O'Brien. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.